Good morning. My name is Kerry Richardson. I preach for the Northport Church of Christ, and I want to welcome everyone to our midweek Bible study today. I want to apologize to those of you who may have been tuned in earlier this morning to our live stream. Uh, for those of you who do not know what in the world I am talking about, uh, this is our first Wednesday to have a Bible class uh, on our church property once again. Uh, we have been meeting for several weeks for uh, worship at 10 a.m. on Sundays, and this morning uh, we reinstituted our morning Bible class at 10 a.m., and we had that in the auditorium, and if you were with us uh, following along at 10 a.m., you noticed that you could see uh, me teaching uh, and a portion of the auditorium there but unfortunately, the audio did not come through, and i uh, not exactly sure why that is. We'll try to get that ironed out for next week. Uh, but for today, in order for you to have uh, the opportunity to study God's Word with us today, we're going ahead and, and making this video at this time. If you've got a Bible, I want to encourage you to be turning to Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9 is where we'll uh, begin our study of God's Word today. Uh, as you turn there, I uh, hope things are going well with you. I hope that uh, you are safe. I hope that your family as well. Uh, but uh, again, it is a delight to have you with us today. And as we get into our study today, let's do uh, as we normally do. And uh, let's pause at this time uh, for a word of prayer. Father God in heaven, we thank you for this day. We thank you, Father, for the opportunity we have to study from your word. Father, we realize that your word is indeed a lamp uh, to our feet and light to our pathway. And we are so thankful, Father, for the guidance that you provide to us through the Word that we have the opportunity today to open and study from. We pray, Father, that you'll bless us in this time together. We, may we learn much. Uh, may we glean some principles that will help us in our walk with you. And, Father, we ask your richest blessings to be upon those who need our prayers so greatly today, those who are suffering, those who are struggling. And, and we pray, Father, for them and any of their caregivers as well. Bless us, Father, forgive us for our sins, and be with us especially through this study. It is in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. For the past several weeks, we have been studying uh, the idea of Pharisaical religion. It is an idea that we have gleaned from Matthew chapter 5 and verse 20 when Jesus said, I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus was very critical of the religious beliefs and practices of the Pharisees. And we realize that if they, a religious group of people, had flaws in their theology in that day and time, then it's possible for us to replicate those things today in the Lord's church. And we don't want to be guilty of that. And so we have endeavored to look at this study called Pharisaical Religion to uh, understand what the issues were with this particular sect among the Jews. We've been asking for the last several weeks now, uh, where did they go wrong? What were, what were the issues uh, associated with the religious practices and belief system of this group of people called the Pharisees? Our first lesson in examining that particular question uh, revealed that they had a flawed standard of authority. They uh, followed what they called the tradition of the elders, what we would refer to as the oral law. It's known today as the Mishnah. And they also tried to simultaneously follow the will of God as it was given in the law of Moses. And you'll find according to the teachings of Jesus that in their practice, they actually elevated the oral tradition above the scriptures. And so because of their practices that were based on the oral law, that tradition of the elders, at times they would violate principles in the law of God. And so one area in which they were in error was they had a flawed standard of authority. Another issue Jesus had with them in terms of their religious practices and beliefs had to do with their internal motives. Uh, why did they do the things they did? They appeared outwardly to be a very religious based people, a group of people who were very pious, who were very interested in, in being pleasing to God. But yet, when Jesus would speak about them, he would talk about their inward motives. And, and he would say, in essence, you have given 
uh, great attention and detail to what everyone sees outside, but inside you're rotten to the core. They were doing all of the things they did, Jesus said, to be seen by other people. And that's not a, a sincere form of religion in the eyes of God. We noticed last time together that they also had a flawed view of other people. Uh, they would root their practices probably in Old Testament scripture and in the oral law. But in essence, what the Pharisees had done was establish for themselves what we might call a spiritual country club. If you were like them, if, if you looked like them, if you thought like them, then they accepted you. But generally speaking, for those people they viewed as unclean, uh, those they viewed as sinners, people who were unrighteous, it's as if the Pharisees wrote them off. And when Jesus came spending time with people such as tax collectors and sinners, Jesus was heavily criticized by this group of people because their belief system said, those are individuals you want to stay away from and you don't want to have any contact with whatsoever. And so we find that their view of people was very much flawed as well. Today, we move to some new ground and, and we, we, we come to another point in which the Pharisees had a flawed theology. And that is with the ability to have an open mind in regards to Jesus Christ. They were very close-minded. They, they were very stubborn in the attitude and the belief system that they held. Now, as we get started today, I want us to kind of notice some things about these people called the Pharisees. I want us to especially to consider how the Pharisees compare uh, against other people in their society. Jesus lived and he walked among the Jews for some three, three and a half years. He did many miraculous works and delivered many teachings. The end result of that was many people in the Jewish nation followed Jesus. But the Pharisees and scribes, they did not follow Jesus. Why? And, and, and why were they so close-minded? Well, we're going to kind of see some examples today of their close-mindedness. And we're going to start today in Matthew chapter 9. And so if you've got your Bible, I want to encourage you to open up there as we look at, if you will, at Exhibit A uh, when it comes to this idea of the Pharisees being close-minded. Beginning in verse 32, let's read together. As they were going away, behold, a demon-oppressed man who was mute was brought to him. And when the demon had been cast out, the mute man spoke, and the crowds marveled, saying, Never was anything like this seen in Israel. Now, Jesus is in the area of Galilee when he is doing these things. Just previously to this text, you're going to find that he's going to heal two blind men. As they were leaving, verse 32 tells us, a man who was demon-oppressed was brought to him, and this man's demon possession rendered him unable to speak. He was a mute. He was unable to talk. Jesus heals the man. He cast out the demon. And in verse 33, uh, after the mute man speaks, the crowds marvel. And they, they say, never was anything like this seen in Israel. The word marvel here means that they were filled with amazement. It was an amazement of a positive sense. In other words, they realized that something positive had been done and, and it was a very good thing, but they didn't know how it had occurred and they, they, they were just simply astonished at what had taken place. That was the reaction of the crowd of people. Look at the reaction, if you will, now in verse 34 of the Pharisees. But the Pharisees said, he cast out demons by the prince of demons. That's a reference to Satan. And so when Jesus cast out the demon from this man, and this man who formerly was unable to speak is able to now talk, the crowds say, wow, what a wonderful thing. They're not sure how it's been able to be done, but they, they kind of say to themselves, nothing's ever been done like this. We've never seen anything like this. But the Pharisees' reasoning was like this. Well, it was legitimate. He was able to truly do this miracle, but he didn't do it with the power of God. He did it through the power of the prince of demons through Satan. And so you see an example, A, if you will, of the Pharisees and their close-mindedness of Jesus. Now, I want us to turn over in Matthew's account to Matthew chapter 12. And I want us to look there 
at a, a, a very similar story. And as we get into reading it in verse 22, you, you're going to almost say to yourself, this, this sounds exactly like the story back in Matthew chapter 9. And you would be very correct in saying that. Let's read it together. Matthew 12 and verse 22. Then a demon-oppressed man who was blind and mute was brought to him, and he healed him so that the man spoke and saw. That sounds very similar to the, to the first account in Matthew 9, doesn't it? Only one difference here is that the demon possession in this man rendered him not only unable to speak, but also unable to see. The demon possession in this man caused both blindness and muteness. And so just as he did with the man in Matthew 9, Jesus heals the man. And in his case, he is now able to speak and to see. Now look at the reaction in the next two verses of the group of people that witnessed this and also the Pharisees. Verse 23, all the people were amazed and said, can this be the son of David? Verse 23 uh, the people here are amazed. That's a, a slightly different word than the word marvel back over in Matthew 9. The word marvel in Matthew 9 meant they were filled with astonishment. They, they were amazed and, and, and they realized something positive had been done. The word amazed here in verse 23 means that these people were also astonished but they also were going to be investigating how it could occur. In other words, what people in Matthew 9 said in regards to the miracle Jesus did there was, wow, we've never seen anything like this. Whereas the reaction of the people in Matthew 12 was, wow, this is amazing. How in the world can this man do these things? They come up with a plausible explanation. Their explanation is, is it possible that Jesus is the son of David? Now, what does it mean to, to be the son of David? Reading this today in, in the United States of America in 2012, we may not really grasp what is being meant here when they say this, but if you went back to the Jewish society in which Jesus lived, being the son of David was something very significant. I'm going to carry you back for a few moments to the Old Testament scriptures. Go back to 2 Samuel chapter 7. It is David's intent to build God a permanent dwelling, the temple. Uh, up until now, the place of worship had been the tabernacle. It was considered to be a very temporary dwelling, one that could move from one place to another. David's desire was to build God a permanent house. Uh, and, and, and God is going to refuse him that opportunity. But he's going to send his prophet Nathan to give a message to him. Not only is he going to tell David in this message, you are not going to be able to build this house, but he's going to talk about what he will allow descendants of David's to do. Read with me verse number 12. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. Now notice verse 13. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Now, when, when you look at these two verses and you look back in Jewish history, you realize here that God is talking about Solomon, the son of David, who would assume the throne after David's death. That's who he's talking about. What God is telling David here is, look, I'm, I'm going to preserve your lineage. I'm going to raise up offspring after you, and your offspring will build a house in my name. That's going to be a reference immediately to Solomon. But you will notice there's something at the end here of verse number 13 when his throne will be uh, established, that kingdom will be established forever. That's not going to be a reference to Solomon, is it? We know that because when the children of Israel are carried off into Babylonian captivity, the, the house of David is no longer on the throne in Judah, in that southern kingdom. And so in the future, we know, historically speaking, that David's lineage on the throne of Judah and Israel is going to be cut off. So what's this talking about? We'll go on down to verse number 16. 
God continues revealing some things to, to, to David through the prophet Nathan. And he says, and your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. And when you start seeing that language, you realize God is not just telling David that he's going to perpetuate his physical throne through his next descendant. We know, historically speaking, that time is going to come when the lineage of David is going to no longer sit in a ruling capacity for the nation of Israel. And so what is this a reference to? It's a reference to the Messiah. The son of David here is not just Solomon, but it's also, in a prophetic sense, going to be the promised one of Israel. You want to know why the children of Israel were looking for a physical ruler? You remember in Acts chapter 1, uh, prior to Jesus' ascension, the disciples were going to ask him, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel at this time? You want to know why the children of Israel were looking for a physical ruler that would come and, and would rule their nation in the very same kind of way that David did in many generations before? It's because of, of this prophecy. They were looking for the quote-unquote son of David. In their minds, he would be a physical ruler, a physical ruler who would drive out people like the Romans and others who might make them subservient and establish their own national identity once again. That's what they thought the son of David was. But the son of David was someone they were eagerly looking forward to in the nation of Israel. And so when you go back to Matthew chapter 12 and verse 23, when it says here that the people say, can this be the son of David? What they are saying is, based on what we are seeing Jesus do, we think there's a possibility that this is the one we've been looking forward to. This is the Messiah. This is the one who is going to restore our national identity to us. The one who is going to sit on the throne of David. And by the way, that was a very correct assumption, wasn't it? They weighed the evidence and they came to a conclusion that was warranted by the evidence. Now, that was the reaction of the people. Look at the reaction, verse 24, of the Pharisees. But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, It is only by Beelzebub, the prince of demons, that this man cast out demons. You know, we realize today in the news there are many ongoing false narratives. I mean, they are repeated over and over and over again. This seems to be a pattern with the Pharisees. When Jesus does a notable miracle of casting out demons from someone, the reaction of the Pharisees is God isn't with him. This isn't the power of God. This is the power of darkness. This is the power of Satan that you see on display. And so you see here the, the close-mindedness of this group of people. Ironically, in John chapter 3, there's a man of the Pharisees by the name of Nicodemus who comes to Jesus by night. And I want you to notice what Nicodemus said to Jesus. Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher. Now notice, come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. When you listen to Nicodemus, he's absolutely correct. Like the people in Matthew 12, he had weighed the evidence. The evidence is Jesus is doing undisputable miracles among people. And Nicodemus' reaction is, look, no one can do these things unless God is empowering him to do those things. Nicodemus understood it's not the power of darkness, it's not the power of Satan. Only the power of God allows someone to do these things. And so when you look in Matthew 9 and Matthew 12 and the Pharisees look at these miracles that Jesus is doing and say, oh, he's not doing them through the power of God. He's doing them through the power of Satan. It just goes to show this is an example of their closed-mindedness. They were not willing to see anything other than what they had determined to see in the life and the actions of Jesus Christ. As a second major example today, I want us to stay in Matthew chapter 12 and, and skip down just a little bit further here in the passage. And, and I want us to see a second example that shows us how closed-minded this group of people was. Beginning in verse 38. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered him, saying, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. Come on. 
How many signs has Jesus done in front of these people already to this point? Obviously, they have witnessed many signs, but yet they come to him saying, Jesus, we wish you would give us a sign. Jesus' answer, verse 39, an evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. It's almost as Jesus, if Jesus says, no, I'm not going to give you a sign. And then says, well, wait, just to wait one moment. I'll give you one sign. What is the sign? It is the sign of the prophet Jonah. What does that mean? Verse number 40, for just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. What's Jesus referring to in verse number 40? What is the sign of Jonah? It's his resurrection from the dead. Jesus said, I will spend three days, three nights in the earth. Then I will be raised. And so when these people come to Jesus and they say, give us a sign. Jesus said, I'll give you a sign. When I die, I'll be three days three nights in the earth, and then I'll be raised. Again, this is not a sign that can be seen in the here and now, but this would be a sign that they should remember in the future. And so kind of file that away. The Pharisees come to Jesus asking, give us a sign. Jesus said, I'll give you a sign, but it's pertaining to something that you will observe in the future. Now, in that background, turn with me over to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28. It is in this chapter of Matthew that we read of the resurrection of Jesus. Now, in the first portion of Matthew 28, the first 10 verses, you're going to find the events that kind of give rise to what we read about in verse number 11 and following. It is the first day of the week. Ladies have come to see the tomb of Jesus. They have come to uh, take care of the body of Jesus. Uh, there is an angel of the Lord who descends from heaven who comes and rolls back the stone and sets on it. Now, after the description of the angel of God here who rolls back the stone, look at verse number four. For fear of him, that is the angel, the guards trembled and became like dead men. So basically what happens is when the angel comes down from heaven, rolls back the, the stone in the tomb, from the tomb of Jesus, these angels in witnessing this, they, they almost become paralyzed with fear. They become like dead men, okay? Now, as the rolling of the stone took place, it was not to allow Jesus out, but rather to allow people to come in and to see that the tomb was in fact empty. At some point, the guards here are going to realize the tomb was empty. They've, they've seen what has taken place. Now, Look at verse number 11 and follow. While they were going, behold, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priest all that had taken place. Their charge had been, you guard the tomb of Jesus, make sure that his disciples do not come and steal the body of way. They knew what Jesus had said about his resurrection from the dead. They knew that was prophesied by Jesus. And so they didn't want the disciples of Jesus to deceitfully come and to take the body away and then go around and, and, and say, look, Jesus has been raised from the dead. You ought to believe in him. So the guard, after this event takes place in the first 10 verses, they come back to the chief priest and they tell them what has taken place. Now notice verse number 12. And when they had assembled with the elders and taken counsel, that's going to be some kind of meeting of the Sanhedrin that's being referred to here. They gave a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers and said, tell people his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So what happens is the guard, a portion of them, comes and they report the events that they had witnessed to the rulers of the Jews. At least a portion of the Sanhedrin convenes here and they come up with a solution. They're not going to believe that Jesus actually was raised from the, day, the dead, but instead they charge the guard to go around telling people his disciples came by night and stole him away. And by the way, if the Romans had a problem with that and if they wanted to punish the guards, what these Jewish rulers said was this, we will make sure to bribe them in such a way that everything will be okay. And so... The guards go away, 
They take the money, verse 15. They did as they were directed. And you see the end result, verse 15. This story has been spread among the Jews to this day. To that day of the writing of the book of Matthew, these things had been reported in this way. This was the common story that went around. Now, I want you to go back to Matthew chapter 12 with me and remember what Jesus told the Pharisees. He said, I will give you a sign. It's the sign of Jonah. Three days and three nights I will be in the earth and then I will be raised. That's the sign of Jonah. That takes place. The Pharisees are going to come to a knowledge of what had taken place in this text. They come to understand. Do we read in this passage or any other passage that the Pharisees said, you know what? We saw the sign. Jesus said it would take place and it took place and now we're going to believe. No, that wasn't their reaction. They were hard-hearted. They refused to believe the evidence that was presented before them. And so as we look at this idea, these two groups of passages, Matthew 9, Matthew 12, and then Matthew 12, and then Matthew 28 put together, when you look at those examples, what you realize is these people looked in the face of miracle after miracle that Jesus did and said, we're not going to believe that he's from God. We're not going to believe in his identity. Now, in John chapter 20, verses 30 through 31, we read here, if you will, the purpose uh, statement for the writing of the gospel account of John. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. John writes here, the reason these miracles have been recorded in this gospel account is so that people would read them, they would investigate those things, they would reason those things out, and they would understand the evidence points to Jesus being the Son of God. And once believing and trusting in Jesus for their salvation, we would find that they would have life in his name. In other words, the evidence ought to lead you to the conclusion that Jesus is the Son of God. It did for many people. In Matthew 9, when people saw Jesus do a, a wondrous work, they said, wow, we've never seen anything like this. By chapter 12, when they see Jesus do this wonderful work, they say, is it possible that Jesus is the son of David, that he is the Messiah, that he is the son of God? Jesus gave the Pharisees a specific sign to be looking forward to that pertained to his resurrection. When all of those things came to pass, the Pharisees stubbornly refused to acknowledge Jesus' identity just goes to show these two groups of passages do that they were close-minded towards evaluating the evidence that Jesus provided and come to the natural conclusion that they should have arrived at. And so today, when we look at the theology of the scribes and the Pharisees, we realize Pharisaical religion carried with it a, a great deal of close-mindedness. And I want to remind you today that we can be the very same way. Sometimes it may be that we, we, we read and we study in God's Word and, and, and it's very clearly seen what God is trying to tell us. And, and just like the Pharisees, we say, no, nah, I, don't, I don't want to believe that. I don't want to believe that. Sometimes we can be very stubborn. Sometimes we can be very arrogant. Sometimes it's because of our heritage, because of our tradition, because of where we come from and, and people that we esteem. Sometimes we can be very biased against the teachings of the Word of God, just like the Pharisees. We can see these things as plain as day and, and yet walk away and say, no, no, I'm not going to subscribe to those things. Pharisees, part of their mistaken and erroneous theology was they were not open-minded, and we can be that way today. I'm reminded of, of a country song, uh, memory uh, d deserts me today and trying to remember who it was that sang this. But years ago, there was a country song that said, if, if you don't stand for something, then you'll fall for anything. That's not what I'm talking about. I I'm not saying have a mindset that is able to be swayed by any and every opinion or, or teaching that someone might give. 
We understand that we're supposed to stand and fight against Satan, Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 and following. We realize that, that we must stand firm on our convictions, but in doing so, we've still got to be open-minded, to be willing to consider the teachings of the Word of God. And if we find our beliefs and our practices are different than what we find in the Scriptures, then we need to have an open mind and an open heart willing to change those things. The Pharisees, they were not open-minded in the least. They were closed-minded. They stubbornly held to the things that they believed and refused to allow the evidence to take them to a warranted conclusion. They refused to do that. We need to avoid that trap today, and we need to make sure that we always are willing to consider everything that God wants us to learn from his inspired word. Again, as we have studied today the idea of Pharisaical religion, we are so thankful for you joining us. Uh, we would invite you to be with us Sunday at 10 a.m., either in person or online as we have the opportunity to worship God. A week from today, you'll have another opportunity to come and study God's Word with us. Uh, we hope to have ironed out by that time the issues we face today, and so we invite you to come be with us here in our auditorium, 10 a.m. next Wednesday, or if you're unable to do that, catch us online and study God's Word with us at that time. Again, thanks for joining us today. We hope you've been blessed by our time together, and we hope you have an, a great ending to your week.